Welcome to a special 15-year anniversary episode of Stories from the NNI. I'm Lisa Friedersdorf, Director of the National Nanotechnology Coordination Office, or NNCO. Today, I'm pleased to welcome Pedro Alvarez, the George R. Brown Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Rice University, where he also serves as the founding director of the NSF Engineering Research Center on Nanotechnology-Enabled Water Treatment, more commonly known as NEWT. Pedro has received numerous honors and awards and was recently elected into the National Academy of Engineering. He is an associate editor of Environmental Science and Technology, and previously served on the Scientific Advisory Board of the EPA and of the Advisory Committee of the NSF Engineering Directorate. I'm so thankful for your public service. That's that's quite a quite a lot of activities. Pedro, thank you for joining us today. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and when you first got involved in nanotechnology? <laughs> yes, of course. Good morning, Lisa. Thank you for hosting me, first of all. So I'm an environmental engineer. I um, basically was passionate about water security, and, and I knew that water was a common major limiting factor to human capacity. So most of my life, I have been involved in the physics of water initially, uh, you know, making sure there is enough quantity. Um, in graduate school, I started focusing on the quality of water, started with microbiology. And when I started interacting with Rice University, first as an advisor to the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, uh, I was so intrigued by the vision by Rick Smalley and, and uh, his use of nanotechnology with a focus on energy initially. And since energy and water are so interconnected, I, I decided to move to Rice and uh, take an opportunity or an offer I had and begin to, to study the environmental implications of nanomaterials. We were wondering, are these going to be a new class of pollutants? How are they going to behave in the environment? And then I noticed by the way that they were interacting with common pollutants, including bacteria, and how they were had the capacity to destroy them. Then we had the idea, well, why don't we use nanotechnology to clean water and, and make water more affordable? And um, that's where we are today. <laughs> Wow, that's a great story, and I think that you are among many that that Rick Smalley had an influence on and encouraged to get involved in nanotechnology or in, in inspired this work. Um, as you know, the NNI is celebrating its 15-year anniversary, and this is one of our special anniversary episodes. From your perspective, what are some of the key research advances that have been made in nanotechnology during the past 15 years? Well, I, I think that it was very important to, to discover and, and exploit many uh, size-dependent, unique size-dependent phenomena that are more in the quantum domain uh, that you do not observe at the bulk scale. In, in our case, for water purification, for example, um, I would mention superparamagnetism as well as uh, photothermal effects associated with nanophotonics that are very, very useful for water purification. Those are two particularly useful discoveries and, and, and phenomena that we are using daily for, for water purification now that we didn't think was possible 15 years ago. So you mentioned water uh, security, uh, and, and this is a huge issue in the U.S. and around the world. And, and one that I know new is is working hard to address. You mentioned um, some of the phenomena that have been uh, discovered over the past 15 years that impact uh, water purification. Um, can you talk a little bit about how nanotechnology might help ensure that people have access to clean water? Uh, yes, of course. So. Um Nanotechnology allows us to develop uh, systems, water treatment systems that are smaller and therefore easier to deploy in remote areas and also allow us to have superior treatment capacity so that we can tap unconventional water sources for drinking, for example, seawater or wastewater, or, or to treat challenging industrial wastewaters for reuse so that we can protect human health and, and enhance economic development. And to give you an example with nanotechnology, technology, we can um, minimize chemical additive treatment. That means treat water without adding chemicals, which minimizes waste streams. It allows us to have 
higher selectivity so that we can have more precision targeting of pollutants of highest priority. And this essentially avoids us wasting treatment capacity on things that don't matter, which is conducing to lowering treatment costs. It also allows us to introduce multifunctionality. What I mean by that is that uh, pollution is a very complex mixture of different things that require different processes or functions to be removed. For example, heavy metals are absorbed or precipitated, whereas organic materials are transformed by redox reactions. And if we can combine these functions, we avoid the, the need for large and clunky treatment trains uh, in favor of, of smaller systems that uh, are easy to deploy. But one of the coolest things that we're working on is that nanotechnology gives us an unprecedented opportunity to use sunlight to decrease treatment costs and, and generate less weight. That was fabulous. And I have so many follow-up questions. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, to decide what to go with next. You touched on unconventional water supplies. You touched on some of the unique properties of, of nanotechnology, such as multifunctionality, the ability to use nanotechnology to minimize chemical treatments in, in creating waste streams. And and I'm I'm sure that as the director of new you've seen a lot of interesting results over your time uh, working in this area. What is one of the the most exciting advances that that you've seen, perhaps on not just the research side, but but moving into either uh, application or commercialization? Yeah, one of the things that came out of NEWT is the nanophotonic enhanced membrane distillation that allows us to use sunlight to basically hit nanoparticles locally uh, that generate water vapor. And this water vapor crosses a hydrophobic membrane to produce distilled water on the other side. So essentially, you are desalinating water using a free source of energy. And this is very important because we do know how to desalinate already. We have, for example, reverse osmosis membrane. The problem is that it's too expensive and therefore not available to many people. And much of that expense, about 55%, is energy. So by using a free source of energy, that immediately cuts the operating cost of desalination by more than one half, making it more affordable and more accessible to many people around the world. So we already have a spin-off company called Sonmem out of Newt, some of our researchers led by Chilling Lee and uh, Naomi Halas, a world leader in nanophotonics, where essentially this, this convergence, this, this synergism between people that are experts in process engineering and, and in physics and in nanophotonics, uh, led us to, to this uh, innovation that I think can be a game changer. But similar, uh, we have uh, been developing a lot of other advanced materials and, and, and practical technologies. Another one that is getting a lot of pull from the industry is uh, these catalysts that can convert nitrate to innocuous nitrogen gas very, very rapidly and very efficiently. So. Um, you probably know that nitrate is the, is the um, water pollutant that causes the most frequent violations of drinking water uh, quality. So it's very widespread in agricultural areas and other areas. So, so that's, that will be another important contribution, just to name a few. Well, I, I, when you mentioned nitrates, my, my mind immediately went to agriculture and um, some of the applications that are being developed to both target nutrients and pesticides, you know, similar to precision medicine to avoid algae blooms and other issues that happen when there's too much nutrients. Is that the type of activity these, these catalysts are able to prevent? Or are they more of a remediation type effort? You know, I, I envision this more of a, either treating uh, water that you are aiming to drink you know, to avoid methemoglobinemia that is caused by nitrate, for example, or it could be for treating wastewater effluents as well. It's a flow-through system that with a relatively short contact time, we envision being able to remove all of the nitrate. Um, of course, when you want to, sometimes you want to leave it there. If you're going to use that wastewater for irrigation and, and you want to have those nutrients, you don't want to remove them. But if it is the intended use is drinking or or, or something else uh, where, where you don't want nitrate, then definitely um, this is a, an effective way of removing it without creating 
waste brines that are difficult to dispose of, which is what current technologies do. You know, a lot of the reverse osmosis and ion exchange uh, um, procedures or approaches generate waste that contains the nitrate. I was recently at a meeting where we had many discussions about the brine and the issues of treating or disposing and dealing with that. So that that's a, a great description. Thank you very much for that. You mentioned heavy metals and, and other pollutants. Some of your research addresses some of these toxic elements or chemicals that are, are found in groundwater. Can you talk a little bit about some of the important results that have come out of your work? Yes, of course. So for heavy metals, um, we are developing high capacity absorbents that are capable almost of what I would call molecular level recognition. You see through crystal facet manipulation and crystal facet design in the future, I think we'll be able to selectively absorb, for example, arsenic or uh, selenium, which are the two that we are uh, working on. But um, in the Almo groundwater, one of the toughest uh, nuts to crack right now are perfluorinated compounds that are very, very difficult to break. You know, the carbon fluorine bond is probably the strongest bond carbon can make. But uh, we have been able, by using single atom catalysis, uh, Jay Hong Kim from Yale, who's part of our center, uh, recently showed that he could very rapidly uh, destroy perfluorinated compounds. Um, in groundwater remediation, this is all done above ground, of course, water that you pump and treat above ground. For below ground, or, or what we call in situ remediation, this is harder. The uh, nanoscale zero valent iron is, is the one that has been used the most, but the difficulty is that um, it is difficult for this particles to move because they get filtered by the porous media. But what I have learned in many years of working in remediation is that advanced materials and nanotechnologies should be considered primarily only when you have current technologies that are not meeting your cleanup standards, they are not doing what, what should be uh, what the law requires, or uh, when it enhances cost effectiveness, like when you can do it faster using less energy and less materials, they offer advantages when, when you need something small and easy to deploy, you know, a system. But, but I would not recommend the use of nanotechnology for treating large and dilute uh, plumes. It's more for, in my opinion, for source zone remediation, for targeting the root of the problem, but not the the spread contamination, because that would not be feasible in many cases. I'm not sure that we've touched on other potential applications of your work. We've talked about remediation efforts, uh, water security and, and water purification techniques. Have you seen applications in perhaps the, the oil and gas industry? Uh, yes. In fact, many of our industrial members are um, very interested in, in addressing water challenges for the oil and gas industry. This, this is about a trillion dollar per year challenge, all things considered, because, uh, well, there is, um, how should I put this, a pressing need for technological innovation to minimize the need for freshwater withdrawals. You know, I should mention to get oil out, you need a lot of water. You know, for in Texas, you need 10 barrels of water to get a barrel of oil out. So, and this is often in semi-arid areas. So we need to, number one, minimize freshwater withdrawals. And number two, we need to minimize the environmental impact of discharging the produced waters that come back with the oil, which are laden with very high salt concentrations, heavy metals, toxic hydrocarbons, and so on. So our approach is to treat those produced waters locally, tailor treating them, and then uh, using them locally to either enhance oil recovery or in some cases enhance beneficial disposition. Perhaps, for example, uh, remove boron so that you can use that water for agriculture and so on. But um, our most important invention so, so far has been selective electrosorption of uh, multivalent uh, cations that cause scaling, which is a big headache for the oil and gas industry. Things like calcium, uh, you know, barium, strontium, they not only cause scaling, they interfere with friction reducers and gelling agents and just hinder oil extraction. So 
Um, the thing is that these uh, ions are present in, in the with with other things that are much more abundant, like sodium chloride. And sodium chloride, because it's more abundant, it saturates very quickly the adsorption capacity. So by uh, using a selective approach of electrosorption, we ignore the sodium chloride and only remove those things that matter the most, which again are the calcium, barium, and so on. And that way we enhance the treatment capacity and, and, and treatment rate in, and uh, make it easier for the oil and gas industry to reuse that water locally and avoid the need to dispose of it. I'd like to maybe switch gears a little bit and talk about the NNI. Clearly, you're uh, one of the major centers in water nanotechnology funded by the NSF, which is a NNI agency. Can you give examples of collaborations or other activities that have been enabled by the ecosystem developed under the NNI? Well, one obvious thing is that uh, throughout the networking through the NNI, it has allowed me to learn a lot from from other people and and recruit top-notch members for our scientific advisory board. Um, But one important thing is that from it is from the NNI that I learn about this philosophical commitment towards convergence and to do team-based science. Uh, you know, so that I, I, I joke to my students, I tell them, we need to make sure that one plus one is not two, but 11. And and that is uh, possible through, through uh, the, this uh, philosophical commitment towards synergy that really accelerates innovation. So, so for me, that has been very invaluable. I view uh, NNI as, as a very large multidisciplinary family that has helped us Uh, grow and continues to nurture our efforts in in, uh, securing water for for more people at a more affordable price. I love that uh, multidisciplinary family. That's a great description. And I've been involved in this community as well for a, a long time. And I remember early days when interdisciplinarity was a real novelty and, you know, crossing even even among different engineering departments, crossing those boundaries was a challenge, let alone moving into biology, chemistry or physics. And, and now I agree that there is this philosophical discussion or understanding under the the NNI that this is leveraging and in, in collaborating is uh, has a has a real value. So I I love to hear the the description that you gave. My next question is is looking to the future, and I have this as a two part question. First of all, what do you think is the most significant challenge nanotechnology may help solve? And secondly. What applications do you see in the future that are most exciting to you? Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I, I think that um, regarding challenges, which are really opportunities, um, are associated with, with precision targeting of pollutants and, and enhancing specificity towards, for example, molecular level recognition of, of uh, I, I think that is within our, our our possibilities, and of course that will have broader impacts in, in, in medicine, for example, in the treatment of cancer, and and so on, uh, in the uh, delivery of, of drugs at the subcellular level, not just outside but inside, you know, to target uh, organelles, for example, by by precision targeting. Um, I am very excited about um, what we're learning about. Uh, sunlight or light material interactions, and that uh, will probably have very important uh, applications also in desalination uh, and, um, you know, minimizing the energy requirements to treat and distribute water. Uh, So uh, I I think that honestly, uh, these advances in materials and nanotechnology will have a significant impact in, uh, again, making Uh, clean water affordable to more people around the world. And I I really thank you for taking the time to talk with us, but I want to give you the opportunity to to share any closing thoughts that that you would like our listeners to know. Well, I was thinking the other day uh, um, about Steve Jobs, you know, uh, he, he used to 
basically uh, say uh, that uh, people don't know what they want until you show it to them. And, and nanotechnology, just like he showed us the smartphones that I didn't know I needed 10 years ago, uh, it, nanotechnology is going to be showing us a lot of things that we are not even aware <laughs> that are going to make our life more, more pleasant and, and happier. But in all of these efforts, it's very important to balance the discovery-driven culture of, of uh, scientists with the innovation-driven culture of engineers. And uh, perhaps to a certain extent, uh, you know, how clear in our minds when we start our research, what are the needs, what are the problems that we're trying to solve so that, uh, um, you know, we can always work on the correct side of the decimal point. <laughs> I think that that is very important to, <laughs> to advance the, uh, the nanotechnology platform and, and gain momentum in, in these valuable efforts. Thank you for joining us today for this special 15-year anniversary edition of Stories from the NNI. If you would like to learn more about nanotechnology, please visit nano.gov or email us at info at nnco.nano.gov and check back here for more stories. Mm-hmm.